I'm going to be talking about wastewater management BMPs, and uh, I'm very excited about this. Uh, incidentally, I'll say that my sister was having some COVID-19 uh, just struggles, and so she called me, and I said, well, I'll cheer you up. I'll tell you about the history of wastewater management, and it really did cheer her up. So uh, you can you can use this for multiple benefits during, during this time. Uh, in the words of the, the famous book by Taro Gomi, everyone poops. And so we have been dealing with wastewater sanitary issues since the dawn of civilization. And so what I'd like to do is kind of take a glance backwards at how how different civilizations have dealt with wastewater and use that to kind of launch us forward on the science behind wastewater treatment and then some of the modern options that are there. Uh, so Melissa's presentation came back and looked at different BMPs that were addressing uh, different pollutants. Well, we're dealing with human wastewater, and so you're going to have the same uh, pollutants that are being dealt with, and you can see them listed there. About every watershed plan that I've seen developed has had some uh, component that addresses wastewater BMPs. The exact rate of removal is going to depend on a number of factors, uh, including the what's the maybe the industrial or residential um, uh, flows in, in some of the piping upstream. But you can use literature values to predict the rates of pollution for these different contaminants, uh, understanding that you're not going to get an exact amount of uh, houses necessarily because there's going to be some treatment that's going to be provided, but it can give you some good estimates. Uh, and the US EPA has some an excellent on-site wastewater treatment and disposal systems manual. Uh, it was developed in 2002, and I've got a link in in the notes to this presentation that you can use. That can help provide some some values on uh, what a typical untreated uh, uh, waste from a household might look like. Then you can use those in your in your load and in planning terms. Okay, so the history of wastewater BMPs, and you could say that sounds like a, a boring subject, but really it's a it's a fascinating subject because you know when you have some rural life, you can kind of deal with it in that in in those kind of situations. Uh, people are more spread out. You can put human waste into the earth, but if you have people congregated together in, in cities, you have the opportunity for unsanitary conditions and spread of disease. Um, and surprisingly, if you look back through the history of civilization, um, yes, most cities probably throughout time sort of smelled like the inside of a porta potty, uh, but that's not to say that some of these ancient peoples didn't have some relatively modern ways of dealing with waste. Uh, indeed, you know, back 3500 BC uh, in Babylon, they used some uh, latrines and cesspits. Uh, even though they did that, they did regularly dump their waste out onto the road. And so they had to regularly cover over the roads with clay, uh, so much so that they had to build stairs down to their houses. So that was not exactly effective. Uh, in the Indus Valley, though, they most homes had toilets and they had a sump to catch some of the solids and then they would uh, allow the liquid portions to go out into drainage channels into the street. If you were wealthy in the Egyptian situation, you might have a limestone uh, toilet with uh, a, a pit to kind of catch some of the waste or to drain outside in the sand. And the less wealthy folks in that society would have a stool with kind of a chamber pot in order to dispose of them. In Greece, there is actually in the palace of Minos, uh, a still is a functional closed sanitary sewer system that captured uh, storm water and uh, would would transfer through the toilets and, and carry it off site. So the, they had some, some pretty modern systems. They also use public latrines and a kind of combined storm and waste sewer to transport waste out into agricultural fields where they would use fertilization. Uh, the Romans kind of took some of these systems and uh, increased the engineering on them and developed uh, aqueduct systems as well as these sewer systems. And they actually used some water recyclings where the water that was used for public baths and spas would be used for flushing of the public latrines. 
Uh, of course, in, in none of these systems did they have a modern uh, wastewater treatment plant, but they were transporting the waste out and using dilution as the solution, as is so, so often said. Uh, if, there, if you're interested in some more of this history, there's a, a great paper. I've listed the resource there at the, at the bottom that kind of traces the history of these things. Um, in the sanitary dark age, so following the fall of the Roman uh, Empire, there was really kind of a, a, a there was a, a public kind of forgetting of these different methods that were there. And there was a reversion to the chamber pot, some cesspits and cesspools. And indeed, during that time period, they just thought that the water itself was was bad uh, and it was harmful to you. So here we have some pictures. This is a, a, a current picture of the outlet of the Cloaca Maxima or the greatest sewer. I love the, the Roman uh, gung ho, right? So it's still located there. It's not in use, but you can still see the location of it. And the red line on the picture of the right is is where it was located. This was initially put in place to drain the swamp that was around the city of Rome. Uh, but then they used that to transport out, at least the waste out of the city and allow that civilization to flourish. You can see here is an example of what a public latrine might have looked like at that time. And that's in marked contrast to uh, the use of chamber pots and, and tossing the waste out of the window. Oftentimes they would shout, uh, shout Gardelou as they dumped that out. And that's believed to be a uh, corruption of the, the French phrase uh, Garde à l'eau, which is watch out for the water. Uh, so this would be common in that civilization. As bad as we have it today, at least we don't have the threat of someone dumping out their waste on us uh, as we walk down the streets. Uh, also common during that period of time would be the use of uh, cesspits or cesspool. Uh, the difference being that a cesspit would be a, a closed, uh, uh, has a bottom and sides that would regularly have to be emptied out. So just essentially, uh, essentially an underground tank. Um, a cesspool would have perforated sides and an open bottom. So some of the, the liquid waste could uh, leach out of that system over time. And these could be combined with a privy over the top, so a place to have some privacy while you go. And this is all the components of what we would call a modern day in Kentucky. This is a uh, an outhouse. So these are commonly used, and in some pl places in the world, these are, are still commonly used today. But a lot of that changed in response uh, to cholera. And it was actually, uh, Dr. John Snow, I think we all should know his name. Uh, he was the one that, that discovered the reason uh, for cholera uh, in uh, a town in England in which a mother was washing her child's diaper near the well, and that was linked to 616 people becoming sick. Uh, around that time also, just a few years later, there was what was known as the Great Stink. And they went through a drought period and the River Thames down uh, near London, uh, it, it, it of course does what you do in a drought and expose more of the banks and all of that untreated sewage began to stink up the place so much so that they had to cancel parliament that year. Uh, so that elevated the public consciousness, linking, linking that with the cholera and you can see here's an illustration in the in the magazine that's showing forth here's the river introducing his offspring of these different uh, ways of causing death to the city of London. And so this began a, kind of a, a widespread move to install sewer systems uh, both there and in other places to move at least sewage away from the cities. So what's the science behind that technology? What well, it's broken up into three levels of treatment uh, and then disinfection. So your primary level is just removing the heavier solids. So removing that solid material via gravity. So in, in the early days, this was done through trenches or pits, but you actually had a, a prototypical septic system that was developed uh, right, or, right, or, right before the Civil War began. And uh, around the turn of the century, you actually have the development, uh, the 19th century, the, the development of a septic tank system. So we're actually celebrating, I guess, the 125 years of the uh, septic tank this year. 
that seems like a very short period of time, and it is. <clears throat> Secondary treatment would be taking those liquid wastes and converting them over to carbon dioxide and water through the use of uh, biological methods through microorganisms. And there's a number of different uh, methods that have been developed, but the most common is the use of an activated sludge and using aeration to feed those bacteria. And this was developed uh, right around the time of the First World War. But even though that technology was developed as early as 1913, it was not mandated, it was not required in the United States until the Clean Water Act in 1972. So that's very recent when you think about the, the, the progress uh, of addressing sanitation in the U.S. Uh, the, the last issue it would be a tertiary treatment, and that would be removing nutrients and other uh, chemicals. Now, you don't always see that located at a wastewater treatment plant, uh, but some of the technologies to remove nutrients were developed in the early 1960s and 1970s. Uh, so even though they still have not achieved widespread adoption, it, it, many times because of the cost, that those technologies were developed pretty early. Uh, and then the last component would be your disinfections. Uh, use of chlorine was first discovered, again, uh, 1893, but this was not really widely commercially used until the uh, 1960s. And uh, it's only in the 2000s in which UV light has become more commonly used as a disinfection met method to treat uh, the, the pathogens uh, and the bacteria that can make you sick. So let's look at some of these modern treatment methods that are available uh, for implementation. Let's go ahead and start with our septic systems. So <clears throat> a septic system has basically three main parts. You have a septic tank, you have a drain field, and then you have the soil underneath the, train, the drain field. Uh, a septic tank itself is a container about nine by five feet, and it's underground outside the home. It's usually concrete, although you can get, get them sometimes that are plastic or fiberglass. Um, it's sized according to the number of, of uh, rooms that are in the household. And its goal is just to hold, uh, to catch a lot of the solids and hold the, the liquids for a short period of time. So all the, every, uh, all the waste in the house will flow to your septic sink. The solids will settle out, and then the scum layer will remain at the top uh, where they float on the top, where only the liquids could pass over to that second component. So this is providing that primary treatment, that removal of the solids. Uh, the liquid will reside in there about two days, and then it will flow out into the drain field. And the drain field, what it does is it's just delivering that liquid sewage to the soil. Uh, this is a, a, tip, a perforated pipe that's over top of a gravel system and it's distributing, um, distribu excuse me, distributing that liquid wastewater where it can come in contact with the soil and the bacteria to perform that secondary treatment, the breakdown uh, of the different nutrients and, and compounds uh, that are in that waste. <clears throat> now, what can happen over time is a biomat will form underneath that in that gravel region uh, the, in the one to six inches that are there. And that biomat is helpful. It helps to break down a lot of the germs and the bacteria uh, that are present in the sewage, the chemical pollutants. Um, but what happens is if too much of the solids of the system leach out into the drain field, uh, this biomat can clog and it becomes too thick. And then the effluent cannot drain into the soil for the treatment and it begins to surface or back up into the home. And that causes failure in, in the house. So that's a conventional septic system and kind of the basics of how that works. But there's some different alternatives to that. Uh, so you can, in a chamber septic system, you can see here on the left, in, in this case, rather than having the gravel layers, you have a, a kind of chamber that um, a, a allows us for increased ease of delivery and construction. You can use a little bit smaller drainage area uh, and this is used when there's a high water table or maybe it's an infrequently uh, used property. Uh, this can be an effective me mechanism. On the right, you see a, a drip distribution septic system. And in this case, 
there's a, a, a smaller drip line uh, that can be uh, spread over a smaller area. So this system has a much smaller footprint. So properties that maybe couldn't handle a, a, a conventional system, they didn't have enough space, they can use a, a drip line. Uh, the, the downside of this BMP is that you have to have a, a pumping tank and you have to supply the electricity to distribute it out throughout the system. So there's some extra cost associated with this uh, on uh, install and on a monthly basis. A system we don't see a whole lot, but is a workable one is the mound septic system. Uh, this has increased cost in places where the soils are not conducive to good treatment. They will actually uh, add that gravel layer, but underneath the gravel layer, they'll add a sand layer. And this helps uh, to provide it, the, that extra treatment that's needed in a built up mound on top of the soil. Once another alternative system that you will see uh, it's actually recommended quite a bit around lakes is a constructed wetland system. Uh, in this system, it uses the, the natural uh, features of a wetland and that anoxic conditions, lack of oxygen that's there help break down those, those compounds uh, through the gravel system. Again, this can, has a smaller footprint and so it can work well in, in lake areas. Another alternative is to take a number of homes that are clustered together and connect them into one decentralized wastewater treatment system. Uh, under this cluster system, each home has a septic system that's then connected to one larger drain field uh, for distribution. So this may be an alternative where an individual property does not have enough space uh, for a drain field, but combined, they can make that space. Another option would be an aerobic treatment unit. So this kind of functions like a small wastewater treatment plant in that it provides some secondary treatment by injecting air uh, to kind of activate that sludge to break down some of the compounds uh, in that. But of course, in this method, you have to, to pay for the regular uh, pumping of the air into the system and it requires quite a bit of maintenance. So it's more expensive. So how do those BMPs play out? Well, most, most watershed plans are gonna need some kind of septic system maintenance education, uh, letting people know that, you know, hey, while even this is working effectively, it's only gonna break down 60% of the solids. So you have that additional 40%. So you're gonna need to pump that out on every three to five, five years on a regular basis. Uh, using water efficiently can help uh, you know, improve the success and even staggering when you run your, your laundry machine uh, can help Im improve and sustain that septic system. Proper disposal of waste. Obviously, uh, this, the system is relying on those bacteria to, uh, to, to perform that secondary treatment. So you don't want to put your pharmaceuticals down the drain and kill off uh, what, what you have in your system. You also uh, the system's not designed for what's known as the flushable wipes, but really don't break down. Uh, so the only thing that should be going uh, down down your toilet is is the toilet paper and your waste. Uh, and then you want to maintain your drain field successfully. So make sure it's not you don't plant trees on top of it, or uh, you don't uh, drive vehicles over the top of it. So these regular maintenance education uh, um, component is is frequently recommended as part of a watershed plan. Another one is just looking for signs of failure, looking to see if there is surfacing, if there's wet areas, if the grass is growing greener, if areas are, are backing up, and this can help to target uh, locations where some septic system replacement may be needed. Of course, uh, it's not always foolproof uh, because uh, on a normally working basis, those waters should be percolating down through the soil, uh, but if there's a fragile pan soil that, that it hits, then those that can quickly transport those wastes uh, through a spring or in the groundwater to a stream. Uh, and you could see uh, some of the impacts at the water body. Additionally, if you have a karst environment, a failure may not surface. So it just may not be treated and leach down into the groundwater system and follow the 
kind of underground pipe system into your, your springs or, or streams. I'd also want to note that even uh, when a traditional septic system is functioning properly, it is not very successful in removing nitrogen. Um, the Chesapeake Bay did a large study and they found that about nine pounds of nitrogen per year are contributed by a septic system, depending on its, its location uh, uh, regards to the water body. So they recommended don't have any construction of septic systems within 100 feet and within 1,000 feet that they should only be constructed if they have a uh, aerobic treatment unit that has anoxic conditions that are conducive for removing nitrogen. Of course, that costs an additional 10 to $15,000, uh, but something like that would be necessary to reduce nitrogen loading into water bodies. And then, so obviously, it's going to require repair or replacement of a failing septic system uh, in in some communities if 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 that is uh, found to be one of the causes contributing to impairment. Typically, this involves a prioritization process, uh, working with the county health department, and then uh, getting contractors with private businesses to provide the pump outs and repairs uh, for those that are willing to to subscribe to this program. All right. Let's look at package plants very quickly. The reason I bring up package plants is because sometimes these are brought up in conversations uh, about uh, addressing waste in rural areas. Uh, small wastewater treatment plants, uh, they're also known as package plants. Uh, they're, they're used just in those types of situations, small rural communities. Um, there's a lot of different treatment technologies that are utilized and they can function, but what often happens is because these are put into place by private owners and the systems age and the owners just don't wanna pay for the maintenance or they don't wanna pay for a new system. And because they don't have a support system to do the repair or replacement, uh, then it becomes abandoned and becomes an environmental hazard that's not easily managed. There's 180 of these small private system as in, in the state as of 2017, they are all considered temporary uh, and they should be replaced if they are available for replacement. That means that the sewer comes within one mile of that connection. Um, as of 2017, about half of them are available, but the problem is it is often, um, it's often difficult to connect uh, with those because of financing or just the logistic. So. Uh, because there is some stigma associated with the past management of the systems, they should not be viewed as a viable solution without the development of some kind of sanitation district to maintain and support these. <clears throat> so let's look at sanitary sewers and, and related aspects of their management, okay? So in a sanitary sewer system, you're gonna use a pipe system to deliver waste from the home to a wastewater treatment plant. And so the sewage system uses a series of pipes that begin with the private lateral lines. That's the portion that taps on to the public, lateral, uh, public sewer system. So uh, a portion of the sanitary sewer is owned by the individual homeowner. It typically extends up to the property line and then uh, that that's the portion of the private landowner. The public is the, is the portion of the utility. The problem is a lot of the impacts uh, can come on that private side where the inflow and infiltration, we'll talk about that a little bit more, okay? Uh, the second thing I wanna to mention in regard to the collection system is that pipes have limited capacity and they must sustain their flow. So what that means is that uh, if a pipe is too small to handle the capacity, there's not enough space in that pipe and so it will overflow uh, onto the surface or, or spill out of that pipe. If a pipe is size too large, then uh, the, there's not enough gravity or slope to move along the solids and it can be uh, subject to clogging. And so capacity is a large issue when designing a sanitary sewer system. So it's not always as simple as just because there's a line in the area that they can tap on and add new line. 
sometimes is that they don't have capacity because of the way the system is built and extensions or expansions may require widenings of the mains all the way down downstream to the plant uh, before they can expand a pipe into a new area. <clears throat> so typically a a sewer line will follow gravity along to uh, the wastewater treatment plant. However, if it has to go uh, over top of a hill or some type of a topographical feature, it will require a pump station. And that pump station will require electricity and triggers to look at the level of, of sewage that comes in and then apply pumps uh, in order to, to, to move it under pressure up uh, up against gravity, up slope. Okay, so downstream of a pump station, you'll find uh, forced mains, so where it's under pressure and pumping uphill to reach the, a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, these uh, pump stations or lift stations uh, can be problematic. Obviously, they require electricity, and so sometimes the electricity fails and they become source of an overflow as as they are bypassed uh, during those failures. Uh, they can also clog again with flushable wipes and other things like that that can back up so they require regular maintenance uh, and one of the difficulties in mountainous areas is that often individual homes have, will have to have a what's called a grinder pump in order to serve a similar function so an individual residence will have to pump upstream to reach the the, the public county sewer line that then can be carried uh, to the wastewater treatment plant uh, so, uh, not in, in all situations, sanitary sewer is not always the best answer. Okay, once it arrives at the wastewater treatment plant, it'll go through a series of steps of primary treatment, again, removing the solids, and then secondary treatment. So, uh, in, in the primary treatment process, there's typically a screen that will remove uh, uh, some of the larger wastes that are there, um, anything uh, from sticks to flushable wipes to feminine products, uh, all these things will re be removed. And in some cases where you have a combined sewer systems, you may have a, a common uter, I, I, I think I'm saying that right, which will break down some of the particles into smaller sizes. And that will then flow through a grit chamber, again, these are not always installed, but typically in, a, in locations where it's a combined system. And these will remove a lot of the sand and the small stones um, that can be taken off and landfilled. <clears throat> the waters will then, uh, the, the waste will then move into a primary clarifier. And this is a large tank uh, in which the water will sit for two to three hours. And the scums will be, that float up to the top will be removed for a skimmer and uh, the, the, the sediment, the sludge, is able to sink to the bottom where they can be uh, removed, uh, used for biosolids or fertilizer if they're further treated or taken to a landfill uh, or incinerated. Uh, so at this point in the process, this removes some 70% uh, of the TSS, 65% of the oil and grease, and about 50% uh, of the BOD. So that, that's just with the primary treatment. The process then continues on uh, to the secondary treatment. And that secondary treatment is again, activating bacteria to work on the treatment, uh, to, to work on the breakdown of the organic matter uh, and the bacteria that are present. And so one thing that's important is that a, a wastewater uh, treatment facility has a pretreatment process. That means that any industry that may be dumping different chemicals that could kill off these uh, biological treatments are first addressed prior to entering into the wastewater system. So in these aeration tanks, you're feeding these good bacteria that will begin to break down uh, the waste. <clears throat> and then it enters into a secondary uh, clarifier where that sludge is then uh, removed and then reused. So again, you're feeding them uh, on the waste. You're adding a lot of uh, air so that they can uh, they can feed and they can activate that process. And so that's one of the main expenses of a wastewater treatment plant is providing the blowers for that process. And then as a last step, there's the disinfection. 
This may be used through chlor chlorination to kill off the bacteria and then dechlorination. So those high uh, uh, chlorination levels are transferred over to the stream where it can impact uh, wildlife. Uh, or a UV system uh, in which the, the disinfection is done through that UV. So if, if done properly, that will remove some 99% of the harmful ba bacteria in the sewage. <clears throat> so under this process, we're not removing nitrogen or phosphorus uh, and other heavy metals. Those would be added in a later tertiary treatment, which is a little bit more expensive. <clears throat> So that's kind of the science behind the sanitary sewer system uh, and the BMPs that go along with it will kind of cover now. So one of the first thing is forming a sanitation district. So you have to have a way to operate this system. Uh, so a sanitation district is typically formed by the county fiscal court uh, through an ordinance and it'll establish a governing board, a fiscal policy, uh, some management authority, and then the rates associated with that. Uh, typically, a sanitation district will start in response to a large project, maybe running a large new line out into an area or uh, building a wastewater treatment plant in an area that didn't have one. Uh, but this would be the first step for addressing sewage in a region. <clears throat> Another BMP is just inspection of maintenance, so knowing what's the condition of the system. That may be through uh, dye testing, which would be uh, taking some fluorescent dye, uh, putting that in a toilet, flushing that, and then see if it fluoresces in the nearby creek, which meaning there's a, a, a connection that shouldn't be there. Uh, smoke testing uh, looks at taking sandbags and blocking, uh, blocking up a portion of the system and then seeing if the, the smoke rises through the smokestacks or if it rises in people's yards or other areas where there shouldn't be a connection. Uh, and then lastly, there's the, the closed caption television or CCTV, which is actually taking a camera down into the line and inspecting it for failure. You can see in the picture there, there's a very large hole uh, at the top of the pipe. Obviously, that's the place where you can have uh, storm water coming in or if, if, the, if the level is a little bit higher, sewage flowing out. <clears throat> Routine maintenance through uh, a high pressure cleaning of the system as well as repair of lines in place uh, through uh, slip lining or the cured in place CIPP lining uh, is frequently used. In, in CIPP or slip lining, uh, it, it's, it's a plastic type resin that's put down into the system. There's a balloon that's injected there and then that's hardens into type of a plastic lining around the pipe that uh, seals uh, any out any outlets. So these are regularly used by uh, uh, sanitation uh, sewer operators. The uh, wastewater treatment plant should also have some kind of fog program. Fog stands for fats, oils, and grease. Uh, just like in the human body, as we all know, if you eat too much fat, it'll clog up your arteries. Well, the same thing happens in the sanitary sewer, and that hardens uh, to be as, as hard as rock. And so they're required to have a program that looks at the grease traps, particularly at restaurants, and installs interceptors uh, so that they don't uh, cause overflows into the sewer as the capacity of the pipe narrows. It's also important to do education to homeowners so that they know the proper way to dispose of their oil and grease. <clears throat> Another BMP is just reducing that inflow and infiltration. So finding the locations where uh, there may be storm water that's entering into a sanitary system if it's not a combined system. This may be through roots, this may be through breaks, this may be through sump pump connections, uh, through a number of factors. And if there is damage to the lines in the system, it's important to realize that while the inflow and the infiltration uh, can cause overflows, but if, if the water table is lower, you can actually have exfiltration for the system. So the pollutants that are in the sanitary sewer can flow out into the groundwater system. You can see that illustrated on the left side of the screen. As we mentioned, there's private ownership and there's public ownership. And so one of the things you can do if you want to, you're interested in the, the condition of the infrastructure of the community is just look at the age 
of the community. If it was built prior to the 1970s, uh, there was not such a, a thing as PVC then. And so you're going to have Orangeburg, cast iron, or, or clay tile uh, for pipe. Um, so these can be subject to, to breaking, to collapsing, uh, to clogging, and root intrusion. So the responsibility for those repairs are with the homeowner, but in some cities, they found it's worthwhile since uh, much of the infiltration comes from the homeowner side to provide some cost share assistance to help address this source. Obviously, if you have too much inflow, as we've been talking about, it will result in a sanitary sewer overflow or an SSO. And so they uh, will release raw sewage uh, into the streams. And this could be due through, again, power failure, could be due to sump pumps discharging and, and taking up too much capacity in the system, line breakings, or a number of different sources. And so to eliminate these sanitary sewer overflows, many of the different factors that we've we've discussed, uh, cleaning and maintenance, uh, you know, in, enlarging or upgrading the pump stations, having an effective fog program, all these things can be done to help address those sanitary sewer overflows. <clears throat> having a plan to repair or replace sanitary sewer pipes is often necessary. Uh, sometimes with these underground pipes, it's out of sight, out of mind but they do have a certain lifespan, and so a regular maintenance plan to re repair or replace is necessary. <clears throat> Another BMP would be expanding into a new area. So again, it's assuming that there's proper capacity, but an extension of a sanitary sewer into a new area can help remove uh, failing septic systems or stray pipes, uh, increase the customer base, and reduce the impacts to the water bodies. Finally, we'll just mention uh, briefly, wastewater regionally, regionalization is often a way that, that can help struggling utilities work together to save money. This often receives resistance because uh, there's a, a feeling with local governments that they're, are, they're losing local autonomy. But there are different methods in which you could achieve wastewater regionalization. Some would be like a mandate to remove uh, a package plant and uh, require that they attach to another system that take over the management of those. Uh, it may be taking a few different facilities and then working together for treatment, uh, but, but there are different ways in which you can reduce the overall cost, the management, the staff personnel associated with it, and provide better service. One final note, uh, one BMP is, uh, is on the optimization of the wastewater treatment technology. So this may take a number of different forms. It may be reducing the expenses uh, of the wastewater treatment plant. Again, maybe it's timing of the blowers for uh, the best use of electricity. It may be adding tertiary treatment for removing of nutrients. Uh, but there's, this is a, an iterative process that looks at the treatment technology looks at if it's working in the best way and, and can and evaluate a number of factors to have an improvement plan to make sure that the wastewater treatment is uh, uh, achieving ends for that. Uh, one final note, I'll leave you with this. I like this. Uh, this is from the year 97, Sextus Julian Frontianus from the city of Rome. No one shall with malice pollute the waters where they issue publicly. Should anyone pollute them, his fine shall be 10,000 sesterti or 600 bucks. So I, I like I, I like the words with malice. I don't know how they uh, assess that, but uh, uh, I like that they had a fine at that time. They were still working on these issues and we're still working on these issues. Uh, so I hope that this presentation helps give you a firm basis to begin working in your community to, to find the best ways to improve wastewater infrastructure in those areas. And so with that, we will open it up for questions.